thanks everyone again for attending. Um, I know this is a Saturday um, and you would rather be out in the park or in the sun, but you're here, which means you're super interested in you know, knowing more about Jake um, and Sean Jun's experience. So <clears throat> before I start, I'm guessing a lot of people when they saw this event, because all of you have, you know, rather, most of you have a background in academia, either as masters or PhD students, and you might be wondering, right, why are we talking about teaching or volunteering as a teacher when you're already a PhD? Isn't that something that you usually do when you're in the last year of your high school or the first year of your college? Because definitely when I was in college, that's what, you know, what people used to spend their summer um, four, but the thing is, you know, I think from my personal experience, I've most benefited from teaching by a teacher in my second year of high school who graduated in with a PhD degree in biology. And she was so good at explaining all the comp complex biological concepts to me that, you know, I was super interested in the topic afterwards. And that's why I chose to do a PhD in biochemistry afterwards. So I really saw the value of people with advanced degrees, with rich academic experience, going to schools and being a teacher rather than, you know, first year college students doing a three months summer volunteering program. That's why when Jen and I, you know, spoke and we realized we both know this great friend from both our sides who, you know, had great academic achievements, but also went into full-time teaching, we immediately decided to run the session and to introduce these two amazing people to you so you can hear their stories and maybe they can serve as some kind of inspiration for you in the future. So that's the background of where this came from. So, you know, enough of me talking. Let me, you know, introduce to you our great speakers today. Jake and Xiang Jing, maybe they can, um, you know, maybe two of you can introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, maybe Jake, you can start. Yeah, of course. So hi, everyone. I'm Jake. Uh, I suppose you can read a bit about me there on the screen now. But um, I'm, uh, I'm English, obviously, from London. I have uh, did a PhD in Cambridge. So that was kind of the, the peak of my academic experience, um, working on a really interesting group of soil dwelling bacteria called Streptomyces that make all sorts of wonderful things that you've probably taken. If you've had antibiotics at some point in your life, you've probably taken something that originally came from a Streptomyces. So I was, I was looking at these and trying to work out new ways of creating uh, interesting and uh, new antibiotics. Um, but then when that uh, came to a close, that PhD, I was looking around for the sorts of things that I wanted to do. And um, I actually actually came across uh, Teach First as sort of while I was looking at other careers. They were advertising at a different, a different career fair. But I, I found them and kind of got interested in that. And, and here I am now, been teaching for two years. So I'm very excited to tell you about my story. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. We'll go into your experience in more detail. Xiang Jing, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiang Jing. I come from Shanghai, China. Uh, I did my undergrad at Princeton University studying astrophysics. Uh, for my senior thesis, I focused on cosmology. Uh, I later went to a PhD program, but during that time, I gradually felt that I kind of just lost interest in doing academic research uh, per se, uh, meaning that I'm not that interested in like mm, discovering something by myself. But at the same time, I am always uh, pretty passionate about like sharing what I know to other people. So I've been doing um, like uh, science talk, volunteering things, and also uh, TA is also something that I really enjoyed. So uh, eventually I quit PhD. And then I thought uh, what, I should, uh, what I should do next, I didn't want to like, dive in a like, full-time career where I might spend like five or 10 years at, a, uh, at an institution. So I looked for some uh, shorter period programs. That's when I figured out uh, this Teach for China program. I think I guess Teach for China and Teach First are they're both kind of part, part of that Teach for All thing, right? Um, so that was also a two-year program where I would volunteer in Yunnan province in China. And after that, 
uh, I decided to continue with teaching and I returned to Shanghai, I actually returned to my own high school uh, and became a physics teacher until now. Yep. Amazing, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, before we dive into how you came across teaching, it's probably worth, you know, knowing, maybe spending two minutes knowing more about your life before teaching. How did you go into academia? You know, how did you feel about your research program at that time? Um, so maybe, I know Jake has prepared a page showing this bacteria he just mentioned. So we, maybe we can, Jake can tell us a bit more because we were in the same PhD program, so. Yes, we were working just down the road from each other. Um, so my academic journey actually started when I was in uh, my high school, Graveney in London. And uh, for some reason, someday I decided I really wanted to be called Dr. Pollock. And it wasn't really, I didn't really know what it meant. I just thought it sounded cool. And that's what I wanted. And uh, was, was I also it, happened to have, oh, sorry, Bia. Was it pressure from your parents that they wanted <laughs> to be Dr. No, Pollock? not at all. Not at all. <laughs> that was all, uh, all me. Although my parents were, they were very interested in science themselves and um, they were very happy for me to sort of explore that more. Um, but no, I think that, that came from myself. But I also had a you know, very inspirational teacher at the time, a chemistry teacher. Uh, and I think we'll probably come back to that again and again, this idea of inspirational teachers. I'm sure we've all had one. And, um, and yeah, and that led me to my path doing a, a undergraduate and a master's degree at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which was in chemistry. Uh, then I got more and more interested in the sort of biological side of chemistry, so biochemistry, and realizing, you know, why am I messing around in lab trying to synthesize compounds when bacteria will do it for me on their own? So I started looking into that, and I started a, a PhD in biochemistry at the University of Cambridge. And if you look there on the screen, there's a beautiful kind of white dots on a plate. Those are some streptomyces and that compound below is one of the last compounds I was working on, pseudo-uridomycin. Um, yeah, I won't go too much detail into that, but that's, yeah, that's kind of the, a nice little slide that summarizes my academic journey. And, you know, the, the, your, your research at that time, because everybody has this big story of what it could become, right? For, for example, I was studying bacteriophages and my one minute pitch would be, it'd be used to treat bacteria infection to replace antibodies, antibiotics. What was your, you know, the pitch for your research? Okay, so the, the pitch for my research, um, I suppose would have been with this platform that I was kind of developing proof of concept for, uh, it would do away with the idea of um, antibacterial resistance in, in bacteria because we would have a way of very quickly, rapidly generating new uh, variations on antibiotics. And so if a, you know, an antibiotic resistance gene popped up, we'd be able to very quickly turn around and synthesize new antibiotics, which would be able to get around that. Um, and yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, perhaps one of the reasons why I moved out of academia is because that proof of concept did not work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, totally understand. Right. Thank you for sharing. And, and Xiangjun, when I heard about your academic background, it just reminded me of the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper, all the cosmo cosmo cosmology. Um, yeah. And, you know, physics was my worst fear in high school, so I have a lot of respect for people we can do it well. Can you tell us more at that time, what was your great idea about physics that you were passionate about? Well, I guess I'm just uh, generally interested uh, in the world around us. Uh, when I was in secondary school, I'm actually more interested in the things uh, that would uh, continue to exist even if human race has been extinct. And I think physics is the uh, best uh, manifestation of that idea. And so I was interested uh, in physics, uh, especially in the universe, because I think that's even bigger than the little earth that we're living in. Um, however, I guess uh, it later came to me that uh, knowing about things is still different from like 
being the one to actually investigate. So that's why I gradually like just moved out from academia. Um, I think, you know, great sharing about your background. I think Jen has prepared a lot of questions about, you know, your transition from research yeah. to teaching. So maybe Jen, you can take over now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I'm quite interested in like, uh, uh, I, I assume you must have some uh, teaching experience or some other experience prior, prior, before you actually choose teaching as your career. Uh, for example, I know Shang Jun, uh, uh, she used to teach in prison and which is, for me is quite interesting and also some other TA experience. So I'm just wondering like if you, uh, what actually, uh, where did you learn uh, teaching as a potential career opportunities? Maybe we can start with uh, Jake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've al I've always been uh, I've always worked with not always, but I, I I have a lot of experience working with children, working with young people. I I've done lots of sort of volunteering, working at camps or summer camps. Um, sort of looking after children that way. I actually spent during my gap year in between finishing high school and going to University of Edinburgh, I spent a few months working as a, a TA, so a teaching assistant in a primary school in London. Uh, and actually at the time, the, that wasn't even essentially my end goal. I was just trying to raise some money so I can go and have a nice holiday somewhere. But I ended up uh, sort of, fell into this teaching assistant role and really enjoyed it. I was working kind of one on one with a girl in reception class. So for some of you might not know what that is. She was about five or six years old. So very, very young, only just sort of joining school. And she she could only say three words. She could say yes, she could say no, and she could say mummy. And so whenever she wanted my attention, she'd say, mummy, mummy. Uh, and that was kind of the extent of our conversation. And I, my role was to try and provide some kind of education for her, which you can imagine could be very, very difficult because um, she usually just, she knew what she wanted to do and it wasn't to sit down at a table and try and learn maths. <laughs> yeah, so I had quite a lot of fun doing that. Um, but I did quite a lot of tutoring as well while I was at university. And yeah. so all of this kind of led me into this idea that perhaps teaching might be a career for me. Yeah. Yeah. So you have um, yeah, some interesting teaching experience before. <laughs> so how about the Shang Jing? Like, uh, okay, I will put some slides on the prison teaching program here, but you can talk about <laughs> yeah, some sorry. other experience as well. Yeah. So actually for me, um, both my parents have been or uh, have been teachers. Uh, my father taught for eight years at a university and my mom has always, almost always been a university teacher. So uh, teaching is not a, like a very special uh, career choice for me. Um, I like uh, explaining questions to my high school friends. And I guess that's when I realized I, that I am pretty good at uh, explaining concepts to other people. And when I joined a college, I did a lot of tutoring programs, both on campus and off campus. And in the second half of my junior year, I learned that uh, a professor in my uh, department, the astrophysics department, uh, she and some of her colleagues has uh, started this present teaching initiative uh, where professors and also uh, graduate students, undergraduate volunteers uh, would go to a, a prison for juniors, I think, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and provide them with uh, college level classes uh, such as literature and math. So I think that's, I think that's so amazing. I previously, I, I didn't even know that you could provide courses and education to inmates. So I just joined this program. Uh, although at that time I didn't have my undergraduate, <laughs> I didn't graduate yet. So I cannot actually stand on to the, uh, podium and teach, I could only uh, sit with the students and answer their questions and grade their homework. Uh, so I did this for a year. Um, and I think it did make a difference to me because um, it basically just broadened my uh, understanding, understanding of teaching. It, it is not like restricted to 
classroom and regular schools, but it could also be provided to many different uh, people in the society. Um, about other teaching experiences before I joined um, the Teach for China program, um, I guess, well, I mentioned that I quit PhD, but while I was still in that program, um, I also did some TA and or, or some uh, very short classroom teaching to the primary schools uh, in Cambridge. Um, so I think those all make me feel very good. Although I don't, I did not feel very good when I was doing research, but I always feel uh, very excited and want to find out some new methods to explain things when I was doing teaching uh, jobs. Um, so I guess that's why I basically figured that teaching might be the best fit for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, sex. Is it challenging to uh, to teach the uh, teenagers in the prison? Like, uh, will it be ch more challenging than you teach for um, other kids? Not really, because the the inmates who uh, who applied for the program they are actually very eager to learn. Okay. So um. And, and they know that if they misbehave a little bit, they will actually kind of be kicked out of this program for a while. So they really cherish this uh, opportunity with us. Okay, I see. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and also I have another question is that, because for me, I actually had four year uh, tutoring experience in, in my undergrads as well for like children from like migrants families. But uh, I never actually think about uh, choosing uh, teaching as a career, uh, probably partially because I'm not really a good teacher. So, uh, but uh, so I know like uh, based on your profile and the background, you must have some other choices as a career uh, uh, before. So what's your thought process and your considerations when you made your career choice? And uh, so I'm just like very curious about that. Well, for me, there was actually not too much of a thought process yeah. uh, because as I said, both my parents were teachers. So I've, I'm very familiar with this job. Actually, when I was young, like in my like early teenager years, I would actually use the wall in my bedroom as a blackboard and pretend as I said I was like teaching. <laughs> I'm just like teaching to my bed and with my wall as a blackboard. So um, I, I just enjoyed this um, sharing process. Um, although um, learning about the world is also another thing that uh, interested me. So that's why at first I thought I would go on a like academic career. But after uh, that has not been so uh, attractive to me, the like the second most attractive choice is just teaching. So I really didn't uh, choose between, I didn't even think about uh, looking for some other career path. Okay, I see. Um, but what about you, Jack? Well, I I was um, I was quite stuck once I I had sort of got towards the end of my PhD and realised I didn't want to continue with that because I think I think just like uh, Shang Jun you said earlier that you you like you like science you like knowing things you just don't necessarily want to be the one finding those things out. Uh, I definitely agree with that. I think Biha does as well. I'm sure that a lot of us are feeling similar there. Um, and so I, I decided I didn't want to carry on with academia. Uh, and I was looking around for lots of different things. And then actually, while I was at a, um, I was at a recruitment event for Accenture, uh, a, a guy came up and handed me a little card that said, teach first on it. Um, and I thought that was very weird. Why is he sort of coming in and stealing Accenture's audience? But um, they're actually they're actually partners. That's one of the good things about Teach First. They have a lot of corporate partners, um, sort of, you know, many, many, many partners, which is uh, really nice. I'm actually applying for some summer internships right now with some of these organizations. So there's a lot of things that Teach First can offer there. Um, but I, I think a lot of what Shang Jun was saying there really resonated with me. I like, so I think I'm relatively good at explaining things to people. I, I like learning about the world and I like 
I like science, I like learning, and I wanted to sort of share that with other people. And, um, and I think sort of once I started reflecting on my own experience, actually teaching did come up as a really kind of an obvious choice based on my own experience. Um, and I think the fact that Teach First appeared to me uh, through this recruitment event and through other sort of things that were going on, that really resonated with me as well. They have this, uh, you might be aware of their kind of mission statement, which is to try and end educational inequality. And that kind of sense of uh, justness or, or fairness really resonated with me as well. Um, yeah, to try and, you know, end the differences between, you know, should your background or the family you were born into really determine the kind of quality of your education? And I think no. So that's why I've, I've got into teaching. Yeah. So it's, I think it's quite interesting that your first time knowing the uh, teach force is quite interesting. But uh, um, I'm curious, like, uh, uh, for both you and Shang Jun, like, how did you get into your current or formal teaching programs? Like, do they have some interviews or some criteria that you need to satisfy? Uh, like that? Maybe we can start uh, with, uh, yeah, Jeff, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah <laughs> I'll start yeah. that. So um, with Teach First, they have a, a requirements of a, a 2-1 at least from a university degree. And I, I believe that's that's pretty much the only requirement. Then obviously there's a kind of a, an application process and they have a, a day long sort of interview selection event with lots of different interviews and different kind of group events, team events, all kind of testing you for various key skills or qualities they're looking for. Um, so I, I went and I did that. Um, I actually, uh, I also started with a, they do a kind of a summer tasting, taster course, they call it the Insight Programme. And uh, well, we, we, I suppose we could even flick over to that slide if we wanted. I have oh, a yeah, little sure. slide where I went. I went to uh, a place called Hartlepool, which I imagine not most people will know about. So I've, I've put a little um, map there. So it's right in the north of, of England, kind of in the middle of the UK there. And I went and I spent uh, about a week teaching and observing other teachers teach in this school here, High Tunstall College of Science. Um, and this actually, this taster session here was, I'm actually really grateful I did it. I actually took a couple of weeks, or a, a week actually, out of my PhD to do it. Um, so my PhD supervisor was very happy about it because I should have been writing my thesis, but but I came here and I did this instead. And um, I, I don't know, just kind of looking at that photo there, that's probably one of the nicer photos of that school. It really showed some of the kind of really stark contrasts uh, of just life in the UK as well. Um, this is hardly pulls the kind of a classic example of a very poor, um, deprived coastal town in the UK and coming from London, it's the sort of thing which you, you very rarely see, even kind of considering the kind of uh, more deprived areas of London. It's a lot worse than that, sort of walking down the high street, seeing every other shop front kind of closed or bordered over, sort of graffiti everywhere. Um, used to be sort of lovely, beautiful coastal town, but has fallen hard times. And so seeing the, the students at this school and sort of seeing how, how keen they were to be educated despite the sort of the hardships that they just endure just by living in that area, um, that sort of pushed me further into saying, you know what, I want to do this. Uh, so yeah, so that, that kind of day long interview session plus with this insight program that sort of helped me get into the, the Teach First leadership program, which is what the, the main two year program is called. Okay, I, see. I think it's good like those kids can have you as a teacher. So yeah, you probably will learn a lot from you guys. And uh, what about you, Shang Jun? Like, uh, how, how do you actually get into the Teach for China programs? And uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, after I decided to quit the PhD, uh, I started like looking for some volunteer teaching programs because I think uh, I the time period would be fairly short. Uh, so for this, 
I always knew the Teach for America program. And then I learned that there is this kind of like sister program in China, uh, Teach for China, which was actually founded by a Princeton alumni. That was very surprising for me. So uh, he was a he was an Italian American, I think. Uh, name was uh, Andrea Pasignani, and he went to China for like a exchange program in his senior year, and just noticed this huge uh, difference in the rural area of teaching, and also because he his exchange program was in Beijing, the capital of China. And so he actually just stopped his undergrad learning and then founded this program. So I I was like, again, shocked. Like first by my um, department a professor who found that uh, prison teaching initiative and then by a alumni of my college, uh, several years senior to me who founded this Teach for China. Actually, he found a program for students in another country than his own home, home country. And so uh, the recruitment process, I think it's very similar to what Jake has described. Um, you just do a online submission of your material and then you will have a short interview. And during the summer before the two year program, uh, uh, the teachers would gather. Uh, we gathered in Yunnan uh, at a high school, uh, did some training and also we went to a local primary school to actually teach, uh, to, to, uh, taught the students for two weeks. And after that, we were just dispatched to our uh, destination schools. Okay, I see. Uh, for your for your current like uh, uh, positions, like uh, mm -hmm. I know that in China, uh, I think the, the teacher needs to have uh, pass an exam to get a teacher certificate or something. Yes. Do you need to do that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's required for every teacher now. Even okay. if you're not teaching at a public school, you still need to get that certificate. Uh, but for teach for China program, you don't have to uh, have this. No, not yet. Because okay. that's more like a volunteering program. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, thanks so much. So I, I know like uh, probably there are many other uh, PhDs of you know, young, young people who are very interested in uh, being a teacher, but uh, could you, uh, uh, briefly describe a little bit uh, uh, what's the career progression is like for a teacher and also maybe you have some future career plan as a teacher as well. Yeah, yeah. Jill, probably you can start with you. Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think if you're, if you're willing to move schools regularly, or sort of yeah, every every year or every two years, then career progression can be quite rapid. So, for example, I've actually just um, received an, uh, sort of an offer to go into a, a new school at the end of this year, and I've I'd sort of you know kind of one step up in terms of responsibility. Uh, I'll be leading the uh, we call it key stage three, which is kind of the lower few years. Of high school, I'll be coordinating the curriculum for chemistry for Key Stage Three at this new school. Um, so what you can see on the screen is currently my my old school or my, my current school, uh, and I'll be moving into this new school um, in uh, next September. Or well, sorry, I suppose that's this September actually, isn't it? But in terms of if you want to stay in one school, I believe actually then progression is slowed a little bit just because it's. For example, if I, I love look at Lambeth Academy, it's really great fun. Uh, the kids are nice and the department's great. But um, there's already a lot of experienced people there and people who, if a position did arise, then they would be more likely to go into that role than I would. So I believe if you're if you're willing to move around a little bit, then you can progress relatively rapidly. Um, and in terms of my own uh, sort of career plans, I'm, I'm hoping to, to stay in this, this new school that I've joined for at least one or maybe two years. And then ideally I'd be looking at a kind of a head of department or maybe co-head of department of science or of chemistry in another school somewhere else. Um, uh, yeah, but I think in terms of very long term, I'm actually really interested in teaching strategy and teaching and learning techniques so actually, I think once I've got some experience in a few different schools and a few different roles, 
I might end up looking into sort of more policy or strategy positions, maybe in the civil service or or some other similar organization. Because I think then I can actually bring my own ideas and bring my own sort of determination to to correct things that I, I feel are wrong, like, like education inequality. And I can actually uh, apply that to a broader number of people rather than just you know, a handful of students in one, in one school. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think a lot of uh, frustrations like where I have been my volunteer tutoring is that a lot of uh, uh, inequality is actually come from the policy itself. So no matter mm -hmm. what we try Absolutely. and uh, um, those kids will eventually get frustrated and maybe give up because of uh, there's only very few choices you can have. So yeah. So what about you, Shangjun? Like what's your how is like the career progression as a teacher in China and what's your career plan in the future? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you go to a public school system in China, then there's this uh, so-called positional title, Zhicheng, uh, where uh, it's basically depending on the years that you have spent as a teacher and also uh, the different kind of prizes that you have got and whether you have been a homeroom teacher or not, then you will gradually progress to higher and with higher, higher end title. Uh, if you work in a private school system, uh, you may not have that uh, title thing, uh, but you could still try to be like a head of a science department, a particular subject department, or maybe head of a science department where you uh, will be in charge of like several subjects as a whole. Um, if you're not interested, oh, sorry, not, not interested, but if you're more interested in like uh, administrative work, uh, you may want to progress to uh, some leader role in the school uh, so that you could manage the teachers uh, instead of like managing the students. And I know some of my friends would go into research in teaching. So there's this separate uh, bureau in China where uh, there are uh, people who work on how to design textbooks, how to design tests, um, and how to uh, judge the teachers and students' behavior and uh, achievements. So you could also uh, go towards that direction. And maybe that's more like policy making. And I guess your decision may benefit more people and benefit a larger region. Uh, as for me, uh, I'm mostly interested in dealing with students themselves. So for now, uh, I plan to uh, stay uh, in high school physics teaching and try to gain more experience with that. And hopefully would uh, later share the, um, either the uh, materials that I have gathered uh, or like the experiences, whatever, and share it uh, onto the internet so that more, more people would actually have access to that. Yeah, yeah, I think you can, you can, you can write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Because uh, Shangji and I went to the same high school. I don't know if you remember, like our computer teacher. Uh, he actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually writes a lot of books. Um, I don't know computer yeah. science. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's an uh, amazing guy. Yeah, yeah. I like him as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So maybe next, uh, uh Pihe can share, uh, can ask some uh, questions. Yeah. She will be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think. You know, thank you so much for sharing your journey to teaching. I think we can slightly change topic and really learn about your life as a teacher because when I was a student, I felt a bit unfair that the teacher seemed to, you know, only come in for two lectures a day, whereas us students have to sit there for eight lectures from morning to night. So I'm just curious, what is the day of a life in the life of a teacher like? What do you do behind the scenes? Maybe um, Shangjun, you can start first. Okay. Um, well, when I was in Yunnan and I was teaching primary school, uh, both English and science. And since I am teaching uh, six classes at a time, so the workload was pretty heavy. Um, there are a lot of time spent with like grading the homeworks per se, because I have 50 students in a class and six classes. Um, you also have to spend time preparing for the class. Uh, I actually figured it is of not too much of a use if you prepared the class, say in the summer before the term, 
because at that time you didn't know the students that well, and you actually had to uh, constantly readjust the plan according to the progress of the students. Um, so you are just constantly uh, like readjusting your teaching plan like every day. Um, and also since um, as a volunteer teacher, we hope to, uh, to bring something new to the school other than like the regular class periods. So all of the volunteer teachers, we are uh, leading some um, special projects or programs or like elective courses at the school. So you also gonna uh, be similar when uh, with the works that I do in Shanghai, although I have uh, much fewer students um, but since it is high school, the students are demanding more from the teacher. So they expect more from you. Uh, if you're only talking uh, things that's written in the textbook, uh, they will not be satisfied. So uh, a lot of time was spent uh, just uh, searching for uh, like interesting stories or applications uh, of the knowledge that they would learn on the textbook. Uh, and also uh, try to like design some interesting class demos uh, to like uh, grasp their interest. Got it, makes sense. And then, you know, Jake, I heard from you last weekend that there's actually no curriculum, no textbook in the UK. Does that make your life more difficult to prepare for the teaching? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think it, it depends on the school you're in. Um, I mean, there are plenty of textbooks out there but there's nothing that is recommended by the government or um, even a lot of schools that I've been to and seen, they, it's quite rare for them to have a textbook of some kind which they'll work a lot from. Uh, what's becoming more popular these days and something that actually I spent a lot of last summer working on is trying to create uh, booklets, which are sort of sets of you know, information and questions and sort of quizzes, uh, which will be given out to each student for each subject and that will kind of form the basis of the lesson. But um, those will either be used to greater or lesser extents depending on the school. Uh, one, one of the big issues that I think Bea is familiar with, because I'm constantly complaining to her about it, is that in schools in the UK, there's very little standardization. And so teachers are constantly reinventing the wheel. Even within my own department, there's probably five or six different variations of each different lesson that gets taught every day um, so that is something that gets you know an awful lot of time gets spent on that and just like Shandri was saying you know marking as well and running any kind of extracurricular club these are all you know take up a lot of our day um, but yeah I mean that's something that I'd like to be doing in terms of sort of policy wise creating more standardized resources and also one of the big reasons why I chose this new school I'm moving into is because they have a very uh, strong set of resources which they, they base each lesson around, which hopefully will cut down a lot on the, the planning time for teachers. So instead of uh, creating an entire lesson, I'm just, like Shandri was saying, just kind of tweaking it based on the students I have and, and their current progress. Yeah, makes sense. And from, you know, apart from the teaching, the content part of things, how much time do you spend on actually disciplining or managing the students? I'm guessing, you know, with Shangjun, Chinese students are always, you know, more well-behaved and our impression is that UK students are more lively, um, kind of don't want to sit there for hours and just listen. What's your experience? Uh, again, it varies. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry, you just go first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, it varies from school to school. Uh, depending on, the, again, the, the individual policy of those schools. The current school I'm in has a very, very strict policy uh, where for if they, if they talk or if they move or they stand up or if they're not doing something they're supposed to do and there's sort of a very long list of rules which they all are kind of forced to memorise pretty much very soon into the, the, their school life. If they're, not do, if they're doing some of these things they're not supposed to do, they get a warning. Uh, and if they do that thing again or something else again to get a warning, after those two warnings, they are then removed from that classroom, not just for the rest of that class, but up until that same period the next day. So they'll spend 
the rest of that day and then an after school detention in somewhere called the reflection room. And then the next day up until whichever period it was they got sent out, they'll also be in reflection room. So they essentially get 24 hours of lost lesson time. And it sounds incredibly harsh, but actually it has totally turned around the school. I was very fortunate to come in when they'd already implemented this policy, but talking to teachers who were there previously, they were saying that actually it was it was a nightmare. It was very difficult trying to get these kids to focus and to actually engage with the work um, because they just weren't interested. But now uh, at, at least they're at least they're engaged. They're doing the work. They're not distracting people. So now the focus is to try and improve the. The idea is now we're focusing on improving the quality of their learning and in, and improving their outcomes, so getting higher grades now that they can actually sit there and, and learn. Uh, so it sounds harsh, but I think it's actually worked really well for the school. And your experience, Shangjin? Well, I guess students in China are kind of taught since their first year in primary school uh, to behave well in class, although at that young age, they may not be taken out of the classroom, uh, but then I think their behavior will be uh, given to their parents. So the students learned like to, to basically to behave well at a school. Even when I was in Greenland dealing with uh, primary school students, um, they, they do not talk a lot uh, in the classroom. Although I think it's also important uh, to let the students know you, like what kind of teacher you are, then, then to, uh, they need to know that you will be enforcing some rules, uh, that you have some, some kind of bottom line. And if they're uh, following the rules, uh, you would be uh, lenient with them. If, you're, if they are like uh, <laughs> violating the rules that they have agreed to follow ahead of time, uh, then there will be some corresponding punishment. I think it's important like, to set out the rules first and let the students know that you will be uh, sticking to the rules. And then uh, most students in China would, uh, would like to obey, at least they will not interfere with other students. They may not be always focusing by themselves, but they will at least not be making sounds to distract other people. And yeah, consistency is really, really important uh, with any kind of behavioral management. But sorry, I just wanted to say something, Bia, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I thought that's really interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shangjun, but it sounds like in in China, the students there want to be in school. They want to learn, or, or at least they've taught that they should be and want to learn. Would that is that correct, or maybe not? I agree with the second half. At least they're taught okay. <laughs> that they should learn. On um, education, yeah. the importance of, of education is, I, th I think it's deep rooted in the head of Chinese parents. So even if the parents themselves, they may not even have graduated from primary school, most of them would still uh, acknowledge the importance and, um, yeah, the importance of learning. Yeah, I think that's an interesting comparison to the, the UK. And I'd say a lot of behavioural issues stem from this issue, this problem that, I'm not going to say all parents, because it's definitely not true, but a lot of parents, uh, and therefore the children, don't really necessarily see the value of school or even education. Um, go to school beyond their, their GCSEs, which is kind of the, the youngest age you can leave school in the UK. And they got you know a job working in a shop or something like that. The kids see that and then they think, you know what, I can do that. Um, so there's there tends to be quite low aspirations I think or, or actually what, what's interesting is that I have seen some research saying that actually it's not that the aspirations are low aspirations are actually quite high it's just that the, the students don't necessarily see how education connects to aspiration so it's not really a kind of a path that starts with education and ends with their dream career uh, they don't really see that so it's be interesting to see what you think about uh, Chinese students, because that's something I've definitely observed with um, students, my students, is that they, they honestly just don't see the point in why they're there. I would say uh, the issue occurs more with the city kids in China, especially when mm -hmm. their parents uh, 
are not necessarily so rich, but at least um, can afford uh, a, a good life. And then the kids would feel like, uh, even if I do not like study well and didn't get a good job, my parents are still able to raise me till the death, till my death. Mm -hmm. And they do not see the point of uh, <laughs> achieving like higher educational level. But for kids from the rural area, uh, their parents will would definitely tell them that if you do not uh, study hard, if you do not get a good degree, then you'll be just like me uh, doing these uh, like hard labors and do not get a good job. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that uh, I feel mostly the, the it's more like the city kids are are having more of this issue right now. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know how to deal with that. I mean, I agree that their parents have enough money to raise them and they don't have, sometimes I feel uh, not necessarily kids, but some some kids that my friends are teaching in Shenzhen. Uh, it's a very, another big city in China. She said that her kids, uh, they're like from like sixth to eighth grade. Uh, their parents are fairly rich, uh, are able to buy like very expensive real, real estates so as to get their kids learning at all. And they think they, they have enough money for them to spend. Uh, if it's not for the government's policy to stay until the end of the ninth grade, they don't even want to, they would like to quit school right, right away. Mm. And it, it was kind of sad seeing that they have this very good background uh, uh, offered by their parents, like compared to, with the students from the rural areas, but they do not really cherish what they're already having at hand. Yeah, and that's a good point. I think, you know, a lot of these kids you spoke about, Changjun, their parents got rich because of historical reasons, maybe in the 70s, 80s, with China's opening up, suddenly, you know, a group of people who not necessarily were educated suddenly had the opportunity to start a business, become ultra rich. So th their kids didn't see the point of, you know, getting an education. Whereas maybe in the UK, I'm guessing you don't have this kind of dramatic change of social hierarchy or class, and you have more stable generations of wealthy people or educated people passing on their traditions to their kids. Is that the case? Yeah, I'd say so. But I mean, I'm not even talking necessarily about wealthy people. I, I'm talking about people who are, you know, considered quite poor in the UK, but still um, there, there seems for some reason, there seems to be some sort of disconnect between um, aspirations and and uh, and the benefits of education. And, and perhaps it is just because for many generations now, they haven't had, you know, any family members who have gone to university, who have even maybe even done A levels, which is, you know, the, the level just before A level before um university. So it is an issue. It is an issue trying to, and it's something we're trying to address in schools, but it's it's very difficult. Yeah, and I think, I, yeah. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, I think like I want to add some point is like, and I mean just by my own observations, yes, like China. I think the education is, I'm not saying all the schools, but uh, a lot of schools is focused on computation instead of you actually enjoy from learning. So I think that makes a lot of rich, rich kids, they, because they don't have to compete with others because they already kind of win. So that's if they do not actually enjoy or having fun from learning, then I guess that's the reason why they do not want to keep learning. That's the uh, that's the issue, I guess. So I, I'm not sure because uh, I never teach in China before. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I'm quite okay with teach us uh, students not interested in like schoolwork per se. But I hope they yeah. have something that they're interested in and would love to like devote their time in. It's just yeah. it looks like for some students there's nothing that they're interested in, like not not even sports. Oh yeah. So that was mm. kind of sad. Okay, I see. Yeah. And and for for you know UK schools, Jake, do you see 
more kids learning because of their genuine interest or is there also this pressure of exams and college entrance yeah i mean there there's a huge pressure of uh of getting good grades not necessarily even coming from the students actually coming from the schools um schools are judged based on the the you know the the outcomes of their students there so to, to the sort of to the extent of removing any kind of other metrics of um you know uh, judging schools so the the, the poor kids in my school they they do sort of they, they'll have a couple of hours before school starts to study english and then for two day for two days after school they'll also do english and they do that for maths as well not science um but they kind of have a lot of extra lessons in maths and uh and english where they basically just learn how to pass exams they're memorizing quotes from poetry or they're memorizing you know calculations all because the teachers know that these sorts of things are likely to come on exams so the teachers are sort of thinking well we're judged based on exams so rather than teaching a love of learning what we're going to do is teach these kids how to pass exams and unfortunately i think that's that's an idea that's really prevalent in the uk right now and there's such a focus on exams really early on in the student's life that i'm not surprised a lot of them don't really enjoy school because they're they're taught that they're there to pass exams not to to learn something amazing and exciting about the world yeah that's unfortunate and is it just for you know a subset of schools or all of the schools because if you ask any chinese person about london schools they'll probably mention eton you know westminster st paul's not necessarily aware of the others is it the case only in the schools that you're aware of or across all the schools even the most privileged ones that'll be for all of them um I imagine, you know, the more privileged schools, they tend to have large budgets and they can they can spend more on doing exciting things for the kids, um, you know, school trips and sort of things to kind of help uh, boost engagement or interest in learning. For example, in my school, there was only one school trip for the entire school that one year went to go on last year. Uh, and obviously, well, not, not this year, because obviously COVID's baffling, but the previous year, before COVID hit, there was this one school trip. Um, and that's just because of, you know, budget. And uh, if the school then was able to improve grades, they might get a little bit more money because they'll get more students coming in. Uh, but yeah, kind of everything's, as far as I'm aware, pretty much everything. If you, if, you, uh, if you look on the government website, which is used to compare schools and to rank schools, all it shows is the grades of the schools, the grades of the kids coming out of those schools. So it's, yeah, not much is focused on the other things. So it's not the kind of happy education that we think about, you know, Chinese people think of British or American education. I think, yeah, it's probably a stereotype that might not be true anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I think I was incredibly lucky when I went to school that I had really good music departments. So I would spend time, I'd, I'd sing, I'd play music. Uh, we had drama and things like that going on. So that really sort of adds so much to the, the school experience. So they're, they're basically, they're, they're sat down every day just learning how to pass exams, uh, which, yeah, is quite depressing, really. Yeah. On that note, let's move on to some <laughs> more, you know, encouraging topics before we wrap up this section. Can you share, you know, the most loving or memorable moments from your teaching career? Well, maybe I should start because you put some uh, these things here. So my, the one school that my one thing my school does really love really well is this kind of a appreciation uh, cards. So once a week, all the kids are encouraged to write appreciation cards for their teachers. Uh, and uh, you can see some of the sort of the nicer ones that were that I chose here. So it's, you know, you can have a really rubbish day 
and all the kids were awful and they didn't listen and they didn't get the, that thing right that you've been trying to teach them for the last three weeks. But then you get one of these cards and then suddenly it's the best day ever. And teaching, uh, maybe Shenzhou will agree with me, but it's a real roller coaster sort of emotions. You can be really low one time and then suddenly really high the next moment. So, uh, so don't take what I, I know I just had a bit of a rant about the school UK school system, but actually I, I you know, you're, you're obviously constrained by the system you work in, but you can still make a huge difference within that system. And uh, seeing these kind of cards that I get uh, really sort of make me recognize that I am making a difference for a lot of these kids who otherwise perhaps wouldn't have such a great teaching experience or, or learning experience. Yeah. What about you, Shanzi? Um, why don't we move to the, yeah, so, um, so this was uh, a thing that I did when I was in Yunnan. I was also introducing some traditional Chinese poems to the students, although I'm not teaching them Chinese. So this here, I, I included a video where the students were learning to sing a song uh, with Chinese poetry. And so I was very touched by this, by this moment, um, because uh, there are quite a few students in this classroom uh, who didn't really listen to any of the classes that they sit in. However, I was so surprised that when I taught them how to sing these songs, they're focused and I see the difference in the light in their eyes. And it seemed like they are enjoying the music, they're enjoying the poem. So that was a very, one of the most memorable moments that I had in Yunnan. You see something different uh, on the student because of a special opportunity that you have provided them which otherwise may be just lost. Yep. That's amazing. That's incredible. What about the students you're teaching now in the, you know, a much more privileged school in Shanghai? Yeah, that's true. Um, I guess the special points occur when the students are uh, presenting what they have done and also when they're asking questions that I haven't even thought about when I was preparing for the class. And those are amazing moments that I am actually learning from the students, like how to look at the, 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 the physical concepts that I was trying to teach. That's incredible. That's very inspiring. Um, I know we're kind of running over time. Apologies for that. I think Jin has a last couple of questions about, you know, kind of your advice to audiences here and other PhD students or, you know, other academics who are considering going to teaching? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we can just directly jump to the, to the last questions, uh, you know? Okay, so yeah, so I, I think like encouraged by you, like your stories probably, there are many other PhDs who want to um, uh, choose uh, teaching as a career. So uh, perhaps we can share some, uh, uh, you can share some uh, some advices for any PhDs who wants to take this path, and uh, would you would you encourage them to being a teacher and uh, uh, and your reasons for that? Thank you. Uh, well, we I can... would definitely. Okay, so I will just go first, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So I will definitely uh, encourage more um, people who are well trained in academics. Uh, to go into teaching, uh, not because usually PhDs will go to university to teach, but I think it's also important for primary and secondary students, school students, um, to get teachers who have been exposed uh, in, in academics. Um, I think one importance is that you, uh, you know, um, you would uh, keep abreast with the like the current events of the subjects, and also let the students know how the basic concept they're learning in class can be applied to real life problems and to make the world better in different aspects. And it's also important uh, to expose, especially, I guess, secondary school students uh, to the process of 
uh, conducting a research. So if the teachers themselves, uh, they have uh, gone through this entire process of doing research, I think uh, you will be a very valuable resource for the students as well. Okay, so what about you, uh, Jack? Yeah, again, I highly recommend anyone who's thinking about it, definitely to try it out. If there's any kind of, you know, voluntary or short term experience you can do to have a go at teaching, absolutely give it a go. Because I think people with, um, you know, from an academic background can bring so much to teaching. Uh, and if anything, you're kind of wasted in the university environment. The I think it's the, the foundational experience that you know the, the foundational knowledge that kids need in primary and secondary school is what gets them to university so if they're at university already they're fine they can learn it themselves it's where learning is really the most important is pre-university uh even maybe pre-secondary but I, I think secondary is a really nice mixture of young students who are learning really important fundamental uh concepts all the way up to the kind of the older ages of secondary school where they're basically like little mini adults you can have proper conversations with them and discuss you know the finer points of research and actually you know throughout that entire uh, range between the within the secondary school uh, within secondary school you can talk to students about um, your own love of whatever subject you're in uh, obviously for me it's science so I'm constantly talking about various sort of interesting things that's happening in science right now but also, I think because you've you spent so much time studying and learning about this own this topic, your own topic, you're going to be a lot better at, or also a lot more enthusiastic about explaining this, and that comes through to the students. The students really recognise that and connect with that. I, I heard this really um, amazing kind of quote about teaching and learning strategies while I was uh, writing an essay, which is. What you've got to do to teach first, you have to write several essays. But while I was um, doing that, I wrote this really great quote, which is the only, well, there's many different sort of teaching learning strategies. And the only thing that sort of connects them all actually is that the teachers are really enthusiastic about trying something new. And whenever you sort of assess the impact of a teaching learning strategy, you notice that right at the beginning, it works really well and the students' grades go up, but then after continued use of this new strategy, it drops back down again. And so actually, when you look at it, the, the sort of the thing that is successful about this teaching and learning strategy is the enthusiasm of the teacher. And that can be very, very infectious for the students. So if you're able to come uh, to a school with enthusiasm and with your background knowledge, you can really, really kind of bring so much. You can change the their learning experience um yeah <laughs> okay yeah thank you and uh, i know there are a lot of like short-term teaching program like volunteering teaching program right? mm -hmm. like uh, and uh, many i think many college students actually took part take part in those programs and uh, for me as well and uh but you, would you re encourage uh, students and uh, phds and young people to um, participate in those kind of program because it's relatively short term. So I'm not sure if on the both on the, uh, uh, the 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 teachers and the students side would it, would it be beneficial for them uh, in those short term programs? Uh, yeah, I'll start. I, I think absolutely. If if you're unsure whether or not you want to get into teaching, that's definitely the best way to do it. Because if you find out it's not for you, you definitely don't want to be stuck in a to your you know longer year program, um, but even for students, they'll definitely benefit from it. You know they can benefit from one inspirational lesson. If you make that a really amazing lesson, the students will remember that for a really long time, and it will have an impact. So absolutely, don't be worried about going okay. for a short short teaching session. Yeah. So what's your opinion, like Shangji? Um, I heard that there are concerns when. Uh young people join like those very short term um, volunteer programs is that the students get used to a teacher, like they're just about to get used to a new teacher and then the teacher is just gone. And especially when those kids 
uh, they are uh, from like less developed area or when or if their parents went to another city uh, to work and they were living with their grandparents so they are already uh, in this kind of like lack of love environment and then if uh, a lot of people just come and go uh, it may not be very good for them uh, so I guess uh, if you're trying to work for some short period program maybe not necessarily go to those like two underdeveloped regions and if you really do go um just be careful about like what you say to the students or how you interact with the students i guess the idea is not to expose to them but not to let them know just like how wonderful the world outside are and make them want to leave uh where they grew up uh it's important for them to like trying to learn and then one day go back to their hometown and then make their hometown better although I, I know this is a very vague idea I personally do not know like how really to achieve that but I think that's a goal that we should keep in mind yeah so I, we are also thinking about that as well actually like uh, yeah but th 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 I think you, 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 your, your opinion is very important because I, I think a lot of people overlook these problems and uh, many people just do like two three months and then then, then leave the programs yeah, yeah. So thanks so much. Yeah. Actually, one, one question, Jen. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you explain what Martlet Society means? Because a lot of people have been asking. Oh yeah, the Martlet is a little bird without, without uh, uh, its feet. And so it means that uh, Martlet can only keep on flying higher and higher and fly, flying further and further. So I want to uh, use this symbol to uh, encourage our young scholar, young generations to keep learning and never stop. That's the, that's the meaning behind it. Okay, yeah. amazing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I think the first question is from uh, Chen Chen. Uh, I already promoted you to the panelist. Uh, could you please unmute yourself and uh, directly interact with our speakers? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. I thought I was just putting a question in the chat box. I'm um, sorry I couldn't show myself because I'm on this giant um, uh, screen without a webcam. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your experience. I have two questions. Um, first is you mentioned that students simply just lack interest sometimes. And I wonder in your, t in your classrooms, how do you manage different levels of interest? And sometimes students um, learn at different paces. How do you manage different paces? Uh, and the other question is, um, students now, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they grew up with social media. They are used to consuming short messages and videos. Um, how does that influence your teaching? And do you find yourself adjusting how you teach based on how you were taught since we grew up in a very different era? Um, just uh, thanks so much for your questions. Like, uh, Jack Shangjun, do you have anything to, yeah? Well, uh, for the social media one, uh, even the students who I taught in Yunnan, uh, many of them, they can have access to mobile phones from their parents. So I know that after school, um, they are very <laughs> submerged in those and also with some online, chat, uh, online chatting uh, platforms. Um, yeah, that was quite difficult. It's a good thing that they are not yet allowed to bring mobile phones to schools so that right in the classroom, um, we could still uh, try to use some demos or videos that we show in the classroom to, uh, to attract them. However, for high school students, uh, since they're allowed to bring mobile phones uh, to school. So yeah, it, it is difficult. Uh, we are trying to show like more videos. And I know that some teachers, they are actually putting up videos uh, on those uh, video platforms uh, as a way like to either to promote themselves or promote their subject uh, or try to uh, build some link with their students uh, outside of the classroom. And uh, I think I'd add to that a couple of things. So in, in terms of the, you know, how does this idea of consuming short messages and videos impact their learning? Um, it's, it's something that's really difficult. And what we try to do, and at least in my school, and the way I think about it is, you don't want to be stood in front of the class talking to current generations of children, but all children really have short attention spans. And if, you, if you've got like a university style lecture, 
the kids will zone out very, very quickly. So what we we do is sort of short cycles of introducing a new little bit of content or a new topic and then working with the students, um, maybe doing something like, you know, a favourite of mine is to get something wrong. So I'll write something down on a, on the kind of overhead projector so they can all see it. And then I'll say, oh, did I get something wrong? Or, or maybe they'll, if they're particularly on the ball, they'll say, oh, sir, you got so-and-so wrong. And, you know, something like that, which they're engaged with and I'm engaged with. And then I go and send them away to do something on their own. And that would just be for five or 10 minutes. And then we start that cycle again. So it's lots of sort of short cycles repeated over and over again to try and maintain engagement. Um, and the, your other question was talking about sort of different uh, paces of learning. And that's also something really difficult to, to sort of get around. Um, I often refer to that as differentiation. So differentiating your, your teaching based on the abilities or the pace of the students. And the, the basically the, the best way I found for that is to come up with, so in, in the phase when the students are sort of going away and doing their own thing, I'll, I'll have printed off a whole big pack full of questions, normally kind of exam style questions, and I'll get the kids sort of just doing those. And then I'll go around the classroom and I'll go to the students who I know uh, a little bit slower or you know, they, they work slower than the other kids. And I'll just sort of have, you know, 30 seconds or a minute just going with each one of those. So, you know, what you do here? What did you do there? Are you sure all on the same page? And then if it's really not working, I can actually pull aside a whole group of students and say, you know what, we're going to be working on this board here while the rest of the class is working in silence on their own individual tasks. Um, and it is very difficult to get right, but that's the only way I've really come across of managing that. Yeah, good questions. Thank you. Yeah, so just yeah. Add, uh, to add a little bit of this uh, different learning paces question, um, I think it's important like when you uh, try to interact with the students, you do not just uh, raise a question like, what do you think? And only those very able students will come in and answer. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you would just call out the students' names and you would direct different levels of questions to different levels of students. So offer them a chance to uh, get the answers right and help to build their confidence. And sometimes uh, I will uh, introduce some like, group work in class so that uh, students could, would discuss among themselves so that they could learn from them as their peers. Sometimes it's more efficient than like learning from me. And you could also require that uh, the presenter of their outcome may not be like the most able students in the group. So that uh, it may be more difficult for a student to come up with his own idea, but after a discussion, at least I think he or she could have a chance to summarize and present their group's idea. So I think that's also a chance for them to like to be engaged in the classroom. Thank Thanks. you so much. These are great insights. Thank you. Thank you. I think Shudon also has a question. Would you like to ask directly? Uh, yes, actually I already uh, typed it, but I, I would be happy to, to, to ask you in person. So basically my question is a, is a, a little bit more uh, in, a, in a broader uh, perspective. It's like a given the ever increasing imbalance of resources that, that are available for students in different areas, especially between the students in the cities and, and rural areas in China. So how can we use education to, to give them the chance to compete a little bit more equally? I mean, um, um, for, for example, in the, in the Chinese system, we use examinations, but um, I can still imagine the difference in resource will just make a great difference in their in their test in their testing scores and in the US or, or, or even in the in the uh, in the Britain uh, system they might need to use recommendation letters that also relies on resource like your connections so how can we uh, make a little bit better education and examination system to allow them to have a little bit more equal uh, uh, competitions uh, platform to allow everyone to have a little bit better future instead of having a, 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 a increasing soil divide, uh, social hi hi hierarchy. Well, since uh, Jen is putting up this uh, contrast of those two schools that I have worked at, you see that actually the, the, the level of construction of the building, they're not so different. Actually, the interior of the classroom are also very similar. Although one is a primary school and the other one is a high school. 
I think the biggest difference is, uh, first of all, the teachers who actually work there and whether you have enough teacher who work on specialized subjects, as, uh, especially arts uh, and sciences and uh, sports, of course. And also the different extracurricular activities and resources that the students get exposed to. Those are really the very imbalanced. I think to this end, I'm actually pretty thankful for the rise of those uh, short video platforms because so many people nowadays are just putting up uh, videos introducing their subjects or teaching uh, just free of charge online. And the students could actually get access to uh, more, more resources uh, than they could get from their teachers. So I think that is a good thing if you could somehow uh, direct the students more towards those videos than like uh, games or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's still I would agree. Is, I would agree. Um, I think, uh, obviously, I can't speak for China, but in 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 the UK, and, and I imagine China as well, pretty much everyone, even in a sort of a, a poorer rural area, will have a, a smartphone. You know, there'll be one smartphone, at least, in a family. And I think education technology, especially uh, recently, especially after COVID, after, you know, worldwide, so many schools have closed down, has really sort of taken off. And there's a lot of really good platforms out there, which I don't say would, I don't think would ever replace teaching in, in a school, but can supplement it in a really good way. And that, that is perhaps one way of, of sort of leveling the playing field. Um, and another way is through schemes like Teach First or, or Teach for China. So where, you know, individuals like yourselves go to these, go to these kind of schools and inspire these students and give them excellent teaching. Um, and and so, like like Shenzhen said, perhaps they don't then go off and you know go to the big city, but they'll they'll hopefully stay in their local area and and keep those skills and keep that enthusiasm for learning in that local area. And perhaps that's the way we can yeah keep society more equal. Amazing. Um, on that inspiration note, inspirational note, I think we've arrived at the end of our time if there are no more questions from the audience. But, you know, before we, we wrap up, if Jen, you can flip to the last page, we like to yeah. give a short blurb of this, you know, mentorship program we're thinking about running. It's still very preliminary at conceptual stage, but we're thinking of doing this pairing between, you know, a PhD students or a postdoc and someone, some student from underrepresented background and how this is different from other programs like these is you're not gonna spend one hour of video chat with the students and telling them blah, blah, all about the world outside, how amazing it is. You, you give very little commitment of you know five, 10 minutes per week answering very tactical questions. And I think it's super useful because that's what I do with some of my younger cousins. They will probably send me a, v, send me a short message asking me, should I choose organic chemistry or you know, this physics course and someone like me who has gone through the whole progress, of, you know, process of um, university and, and, and graduate school, I will give them recommendations, you know, and tactical textbook recommendations or, you know, kind of, you know, how do you smartly choose your courses in order to fit your interest or future um, future plans. So I think, you know, we're hoping that this program will be something different. That's very low commitment, but the advice you give them can really change their, you know, daily behavior, help them choose, make better options. Um, and the kind of respect they will have for someone like you will be so high that everything you say to them will actually, you know, they are, they'll actually do it and follow your recommendation. So this is still very pr preliminary. We'll work with couple of other people, maybe even get Jake and Shandrin's input into what are the real needs. And then once we are um, ready to launch it, we'll get in touch with everybody who attended here and see if you're interested in be a mentor. Yeah. So yeah, that sorry. being said, you know, thank you so much to Jake and Shandrin for taking the time um, to tell us about your experience. This is super inspirational. Hopefully the audience took something away helpful for them as well. Yeah, 
Thank you. And also I will compile some, uh, a few slides which we did not cover uh, today because uh, Jack and Shangjin put a lot of time on that. So I will compile it and post it on public domain as well so that we can be fully covered. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thanks so much. And uh, thanks so much, Jack and Shangjin for the very nice sharing today. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you for organizing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, see you, see you everyone in the next episodes. <laughs>